Welcome back to To The Point. Well, it is an election year, and that means that there are a lot of politicians out doing what politicians do, trying to get reelected. However, you may be surprised to know that the Michigan State Legislature has been doing something else. They've been passing legislation, and quite a bit of it. Quite a bit of it has been bipartisan, too. We sat down with Senate Majority Leader Arlen Meekoff to talk about what's going on in the Senate and House and how it could impact you. Senator, it has been a busy period for you and your colleagues over in Lansing, and, and I would say a little uncharacteristically so, because I think sometimes in an election year, some things go undone. Now, in fairness, the Senate's not up for election, but nonetheless, you've been working on a lot of legislation. Some of it's passed pretty handily. Let's talk starting with the marijuana uh, mm -hmm. bills that passed out. The governor's already signed those. Correct. It changes and refines the way we handle medical marijuana. It was pretty lively debate on the Senate floor, but it passed nonetheless. What's your take on that? Well, since 2008, the citizens actually put the law in place to, to have medical marijuana. And what we've just done is to take the opportunity to listen to patients, caregivers, healthcare uh, officials, uh, nurses, doctors, village, township, city officials to, on ways that we could make the law better and, and more productive because it was pretty loose. And we wanted to make sure that indeed if it is uh, medical and medicine, that it be controlled as such and this is our best attempt to do that. And we should point out, as I did with uh, your colleague on the Democratic side with Senator Ananick a couple of weeks ago, the interpretation and enforcement varied from jurisdiction to jurisdiction, right. and that made it difficult for people who were uh, trying to access medical marijuana. So, I mean, that was a problem, too. Yeah, it, right. And it would be uh, thought about differently or, or, or with different communities. So what we did is uh, leave in place a lot of local control on how things are done, but uh, given them a structure for which they can do that. An example would be the city of Lansing has 80 dispensaries. Now, if you take that and divide it by how many people there are in the city of Lansing, that's one dispensary for every 1,200 people. Seems excessive. So what this has done is give a structure to that, a framework to that, guarantees that what we're looking at in medical marijuana is actually being used as medicine. It's being tracked from seed to sale and uh, gives patients safe access to this, the, the, the law that people put in place in 2008. Unrelated, but something that people will be interested in, corrections reform. You worked on a series of 19 bills, you said? Yeah, it was 19 bills. Senator Pro's worked on this as a body of work that he's worked on from the House into the Senate. And uh, 19 bills, every single one except one passed unanimously, bipartisan. And the one that didn't pass unanimously was only had one no vote. And sent over now to the House for their consideration. This is uh, a series of things of how, how are we getting pr people ready for parole? Uh, if they don't have the things that they need, why don't they have them? So that at the earliest release date, if they're ready to go, if they're not a danger to society, we can integrate them back into the, uh, the society with a job and, and the skills that they need to be successful when they get out. Talk to me about the cooperation, because the next thing I want to talk about is something I just returned from M City with the governor a couple of weeks ago, a fascinating visit, and obviously there was a big package of bills that I think may have more impact on Michigan's economic future than most anything else you could have done about the autonomous driving cars. That too passed unanimously. Uh, people like to remind me, you know those guys in Lansing don't get along, they can't cooperate, they, they, they don't work together. Well, they are working together. How? What is happening? Why is this... Uh, coming at this time on some some pretty big legislation. I mean, corrections reform is generally uh, one of those kind of contentious issues. T typically, but again, we're, we're finding common ground on things that which we can work to improve things in Michigan. And Michigan has always been the leader in auto technology, not always a, having all the manufacturing, but this is the next logical sequence in that as we go forward. And this is the jobs that I want for my kids and my grandkids, the stuff that is high tech, high paying, helps diversify our economy, and uh, we want to be known for that automotive technology and that be the forefront and the thought of that. And this is the next part of that. And it also helps uh, the, the Ypsilanti site of which you spoke to repurpose that to make sure it can be used for all of that testing. It's like real-time testing because it's very large, has overpasses, roads, all kinds of things. It's not just modeling. It'll be actual testing. When you think about that future, I mean, one of the things uh, that candidate Rick Snyder talked about was changing Michigan's economy so you don't ride the, the boom and bust of the auto industry as we have for decades. And when I talked to him about this, this was kind of part of his interest in this. He wants to be ahead of the curve. Obviously, there are a lot of other states that are trying to do the same thing, but he wants to be ahead of the curve. Uh, does this put us in that situation where 
as that technology changes, we don't have to worry about catching up? Is this kind of a preemptive strike? You well, if you've heard the GM folks and other people say that, their business is going to change more in the next five years than it has in 50 years. And it has to do with this autonomous part of it. It's more not necessarily about you owning a car. It's about how do you get from point A to point B. And we have all kinds of other support things coming around that that makes a lot of sense, like the company that came here, Switch, uh, looking at all the types of things that we do with technology. Um, this is an effort to make sure that we are on the forefront of that. And all those folks that left during the, during the mid-'80s when we had that exodus, we would like them to come back because we're going to have those jobs here. One of the interesting things about those jobs you're talking about is that you've got to have people who are qualified to take them. And it might not seem such, but one of the other bills that you dealt with may move towards that, and that's the third grade reading bill. And I think there are some folks that may have the wrong impression of what that is. So tell me, first of all, the action you took, and tell me what you believe it will do. Now, this is a, a lot of work by Representative Price and Senator uh, uh, Phil Pavlo, and what it does is uh, help and give tools to kids that are really struggling before third grade. And it's early intervention so that they can, get, when they get to third grade, if there's an obvious problem, there could be some retention there and there's some parent input and the superintendent about if that child should be moved forward. Uh, the, the statistic and the stat that we like to cite, and I believe is so true, before third grade you're learning to read, and after third grade you read to learn. And that skill is so critical for them to move forward. And I think it, it's uh, a great body of work. It was by a conference committee that it came out this week and it passed the House and the Senate. It's on its way to the governor's desk. One of the things that I was struck by this past week, I went to a curriculum conference at my child's elementary school. And they were talking about the importance of reading. And if you read at grade level, that your percentile chances of success, and by success graduating from the 12th grade, go way up, way up into the 80th yes. and be above. And if you're below grade, even by one letter position, uh, your chances drop off dramatically. So getting people through high school then to a trade or a college or whatever it is will be crucial for filling those jobs, those high-tech jobs. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's really, and the parental involvement on the front of it, I think, is the most important part because they, it's not a surprise to them if their kid isn't doing well by, by the end of third grade. They're going to know right all the way along so that they can intervene with the, with the teacher to make sure that they get those skills. Uh, for a long time, the legislature has been dealing with issues in Flint and there's been more activity on that. Where are we in the recovery of Flint? I ask that largely because I put that question obviously to Senator Ananek who is from there, but because one of the things, even though we were up there recently uh, for another candidate visit, one of the things that you're struck by is at once every media outlet in the entire country was in Flint and now they're not. And the problem still persists. I mean, there are obviously still needs. Uh, what is the legislature doing? Uh, we just passed out of government operations uh, this week uh, the ability for the Flint to create a promise zone for education. Uh, so uh, pro um, put forth a, an authority tool so that the city government there wants to use it to for specific things. They'll be able to do that. And then the water report that's coming out, Flint report that's coming out from Senator Stamas in, the, in a few weeks, will also have some more action, legislative action that we can do to make sure that uh, water standards are correct. Uh, that they can't be messed around with, that they actually are true science, and that we have, at least as near as we can, try to prevent it from happening again. And I'm uh, Jim Ananek, Senator Ananek is one of my personal friends, and I'll be in about two weeks, I'll be up there with him for the day, uh, looking at all the stuff that's been going on. He's invited me, and I'm, I'm happy to go. When you just talk about this conversation that we've had over these past few minutes, I mean, that is a lot of legislative activity. And again, I, I point out, it is an election year. Is there a renewed effort on your part or on the entire Senate's part to get more of these things done because uh, really if you look at those two weeks, there was one week when you were waiting for the House I think on some items, you look at those two weeks, that's a lot of legislative activity in a very short period of time. Uh, but remember that all the committee hearings, all the other things were going on prior to that. Uh, sometimes it takes a little longer to get enough of the, the folks together to understand what problem it is you're trying to solve and then what are the solutions? Can you agree on the solutions? And uh, between Senator Anik and I, we've been very successful at sitting down, saying, look, here's the problem to solve. Here's the two or three things we can do that we agree upon. The rest we'll keep working on, and let's keep the ball moving. Because it's important for the citizens of Michigan to, to actually not think about their state government, that we're doing things in a, in a way that doesn't interfere with their normal life. And we're trying to do that.
You've been in the legislature 12 years now? A little over 10. A little, yeah, that's yeah. right. You had the two terms. So uh, tell me how it's uh, different, how it's changed, what the attitude is, if it has. Uh, it certainly has. I think for the general public, at least from what I hear in my district, is there's a lot more comfort, comfort and confidence that state government is actually functioning the way that it should. Now, most people would say it's a necessary evil state government, but there are a lot of things that, that we need to do well so that, again, as I said before, that people don't wake up every morning and think, what is Lansing doing to me today? That, that it functions the way that it should, and it's efficient as much as possible. One of the things that the House dealt with and has been talked about for a long time, and I mean for a long time, and that's the Freedom of Information Acts, and changing it in the state to apply to lawmakers and the governor as it does in uh, many other states. And, and I, I, I hedge that a little bit because states have different things that are covered. For example, in some states, a governor uh, might be subject to FOIA for this group of activities and not for this group of activities. So w with that said, the House passed out some bills that will be coming towards the Senate. What, what should we expect? Yeah, I, I haven't read all of them yet. There's a number of them that I haven't read. So there's a number of things to which we already do. We're subject to Open Meetings Act. We, uh, we report all the, the salary information for lawmakers and staff. And a lot of our Senate rules that we have mirror the sunshine laws of other states. So we already do a lot of it. My biggest concern is, and I think some of it's addressed in there, but I, I have to check a little more, is when a constituent interacts with, with my office, oftentimes there's personal information. Oftentimes they are... Um, perceived to be in trouble with the Treasury or DEQ, or they don't, they don't want that information to be public. Uh, so anything to, uh, between the constituent and, and our office obviously would be off limits, and I want to make sure that they're protected, because otherwise why would they call my office for help? So we're going to make sure that those things are looked at, uh, probably during lame duck, and we'll see where that goes. Uh, again, I haven't read all of them yet, but I'm very interested. Well, I want to talk to you about lame duck, but, but I, I bring up another uh, question about that, because Obviously, there are those of us in the press that we want to know everything you do and everything you say. Uh, on the other hand, not just constituents, but for example, you mentioned earlier Switch. Uh, they had had conversations with lawmakers uh, prior to any announcement, but because of the nature of their business, they didn't want that out there too. So uh, some of those things might be subject to FOIA, and, and that could be difficult for them. It could be a competitive disadvantage for somebody at that point. I mean, they, they talk to lawmakers, other um, uh, companies talk to lawmakers about is this possible in Michigan? Are you open to this type of stuff in Michigan? And I want to say we are, uh, for me in the Senate, we really want to make sure that we are opening, open and welcome to a lot of new industries, a lot of new things. I mean, the welcome mat's going to be open, and we want to try our best not to put pe uh, barriers in their way and want them to come to Michigan. Let's talk about lame duck. We're getting a little ahead of ourselves. There's an election between now and then. But after that election, whatever the outcome is, uh, there will be a bunch of lawmakers over in the House who will no longer be in the House in January and all of the senators, as I pointed out earlier, will, will come back. There are no elections uh, for senators. But that period of time from November until the end of the year is sometimes kind of chaotic because... Sometimes? <laughs> well, You've been there enough, you know. It's, it's <laughs> typically... Right, it's, it's always chaotic. Yeah, right. uh, what, what do we expect this year? Um, there's a number of things that we still need to work on, energy being one of them. There's a few other things, maybe the FOIA stuff. Um, but uh, for the most part, we're going to have folks that really are looking at if they've served their six years, they may have a, a particular issue they've been working on for their constituents or their community for the whole time they're there and they're not been able to get it done. And so we're going to try to do that if it makes sense. I mean, it has to make sense for all of Michigan and you can't just pick and choose them. You have to do things that are generally in the best interest of the constituents. And let's finish our conversation with uh, one of those subjects you brought up, which is energy. Uh, that has proven to be... Um, at least in the conversations, a difficult subject for people to get their arms around. It was yeah. difficult when yeah. you did it last time. Yes. And it, it, it really does have, we talk about impact on the future, it has a big impact. Is the question about choice and how much and how much reserve that those choice companies have to have, is that kind of where the argument is or the concern is? That's some of the argument. And for your viewers, I think most of them look, think about their energy when they look at their bill, what, how much they got to pay, and they want, they want the lights to go on when they hit the switch. But it's way more complicated than that between generation, transmission, these open retail access type things with people that are on choice. A lot of our government entities, a lot of our schools are on retail choice, which saves them a lot of money. Um, 
but we have a, an ever-growing or a different changing atmosphere as the federal government shuts down on a lot of these coal plants and we haven't built another one recently and it takes a while to build. So that open retail access market is generally because we have too much energy being generated. So if there isn't as much generated, how do you keep that open and what, what, how does that happen? And that is one of the big questions. And that could consume a lot of time if you bring that up and land. It, it could, yes. So whatever happens, it looks like the legislature will be back after the election and we'll be following them then to find out just exactly what happens in that so-called lame duck session. But before that, there is an election coming up 